Hello there. You are welcome to the revision show on your Joy Learning channel. This is your mathematics class, and I have the pleasure of guiding you through this adventure in mathematics, especially if you are a final year student preparing for that almighty examination. This is Danso. I am presenting to you the second and concluding part of the topic plane geometry. Once again, you are welcome to the revision show. Today, I intend to deal with one of the very nutty subtopics in plane geometry. I'm talking about circle theorems. Yeah, circle theorems. They are scattered all over the examination. So today, my intention is that when we are done, you should be able to demolish any question or problem having to do with circle theorems. You are welcome. All right. In today's lesson, we shall be considering a number of things. We shall be considering some of the things we have done prior to now. We have dealt with plane geometry. And in plane geometry, we succeeded in a number of things. Today, I hope that we use that knowledge to kind of, to use the military term, attack circle theory or circle theorem. What are the things we learned from plane geometry? I'd like to take you through them. Before then, what should this lesson help us achieve? I'll show you. At the end of this lesson, plane geometry, circle theorems, I hope that you will be able, for example, to use the theorems to deal with any problem. The theorems are not too many. There are a few. Well, in your books, I suspect, they look a lot. They're really not a lot. There's just a few of them. I'll show you how to remember them and how to use them. So let's get going. Well, at the end of this lesson, I hope you will be able to clearly, very clearly, define a circle. What a circle is? The parts of the circle. Very critical, the parts of the circle. I also hope that you'll be able to state and use the theorems appropriately as angles and are subtended by arcs and by chords. I also hope that you'll be able to use the relationships between and among angles to determine unknown angles subtended by arcs or chords. Finally, I hope that you'll be able to use the knowledge of properties of plane shapes other than the circle to solve angular problems in circles. All right, so look at this problem on the board. This is question 9b, June 2014. This is question 9b for West African Examinations Council's question for 2014. We will deal with this question much later. For now, what did the chief examiner say? The chief examiner says, most candidates could not recall the relevant circle theorems which would enable them to solve the problem. In view of this, most candidates did not attempt the question. That was a sad commentary. Most candidates did not attempt the question. The question was demanding that we find angles WYZ and angle YEZ. Unfortunately, because it was question nine, an optional question, most candidates avoided it. Let's look at another one. We have another problem. Question 3B, June 2015. It says, most candidates, this is what the examiner had to say, his observation, the chief examiner. Most candidates did not answer the question since they could not recall the appropriate circle theorems to solve the problem. They could not recall. Today, I hope I'll help you recall 
and find a way to recall when you need it most. Another problem. Question 11, June 2015. This is what the chief examiner had to say about students' attempt on this question. The chief examiner says, unfortunately, sadly, if I may add, most of them, that is, the candidates, ignored the question. It was observed that most candidates were not comfortable with the question. They were not comfortable. Another very sad commentary. Question 8B of that same problem. The chief examiner had this to say. Candidates were specifically asked to illustrate the given information in a diagram. But unfortunately, most of them could not do it. And their performance was poor. That would not be you at the end of this lesson. Question 8A, 2017. Most candidates who answered the question demonstrated that the understanding of geometri geometrical concepts was woefully inadequate. They could not apply the cyclic quadrilateral theory and other geometric principles to solve the problem. Understanding of geometric concepts woefully inadequate. All right. What more did the chief examiner have to say? The chief examiner had question 4B, 2018. His observation, most candidates, and this is a funny one, most candidates added 65, angle SRQ, SRP, and 48, angle QPR, and subtracted the result from 180, rather arbitrarily, without recourse to the given cyclic quadrilateral. Well, if this has been your challenge, I want to give you perspective. On your screen are three faces. The face on your bottom left is the face of Wayne Dyer. Wayne Dyer. When I made that statement, it was eloquently um, quoted again by Ghana's own Selam Adadivo. MTN CEO Ghana. It says, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. If you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So now, let me address you, my audience. If circle theory or circle theorem has been a challenge, I would like to say, change the way you look at it. If you change the way you look at it, the way you look at it will help you change it. If it has been a challenge year one, year two, and now in year three, about to write your final exams and it's still a problem, you ought to change the way you look at it. And believe Wayne Dyer, believe Selam Adadivo, and please believe me, Circle Theorem will change. Let's recap. What is a circle? A circle is the locus of points equidistant from a reference point. A circle is the locus of points equidistant from a reference point. What does that mean? It is also defined as the shape produced when a plane cuts the x-axis of rotation of a double right circular cone at right angles. Now, please take down those definitions. A circle is the locus of points equidistant from a reference point. Now, what does the word locus mean? Locus is a Latin word. It is simply defined as a place, a location, a locality. That is a locus. So you hear the lawyer say, you don't have locus here. What is your locus there? They just mean to say, what's your place? Well, just for learning purposes, locus 
is about the same origin we get the word locality. So the locus is the path traced by the moving point or points from the reference point. It is the path traced. It is the path traced. The path traced. So a circle is a path traced by a moving point. So please keep that in mind. As we progress, you will find out that this definition becomes central, pivotal to what we are doing. All right. So it is the path traced. Equidistance. What does it mean when we say something is equidistant? Equidistance refers to it's just equal distance. Equi equal distance or distant. So a circle is equidistant from a reference point. Let me show you a few diagrams here. And hopefully you will get this. Hello viewers, apologies we had some technical challenges. We were talking about equidistance and locus. So what is equidistance? We said it just means equal distance. And we said the locus is the place or the point, the location, the path traced. Let's illustrate it. We have a point. Say we have a point, as you can see on your screen. We have a point. This point has another point. Point P subscript O or zero. If we have a line from the first point to point P subscript O, and we call that point R, and say we have another point, point P subscript one, and a line the same length as from the first point to P subscript zero. And a third point. So we have a third point, P subscript two. If again, we have the same length and we did that on and on, we'll have a series of points. Now, because these points, at every point in time, no pun intended, at every point in time, as our units away from the point of origin, we will call that something. We will call those set of points the locus, the path trace. So essentially, a circle is made of points. Each of them a certain distance away from the reference point O. That is the definition of a circle. The locus, the path traced by a point in such a way that it is always at a certain distance constant distance from the reference point. What is a theorem? A theorem is simply an idea that can be proven or shown as true. It can be shown as true. So that makes it a theorem. It is a proposition which is not self-evident but can be proved by a chain of reasoning. And note this because when we begin to solve problems you would have to have a chain of reasoning. It is a truth that is established by means of other accepted truths. So that's a theorem. So in our cycle theorem class today, we're going to be using propositions, truths, to prove other truths. A key concept to understand. You will meet the word subtend or subtended. You will meet it a lot. 
It means to stretch under. I like to use a very simple term, made. So the angle subtended simply means the angle made or the angle formed. Angles are usually formed in circles by two things, by an arc and or by a chord. Indeed, it's not really an all thing because both of them do it together. Another concept you would need to have in mind is that angles formed Angles are either formed at the center or at the circumference. They are formed at the center or at the circumference. Usually, they are located in these two places. However, they could be formed elsewhere. But principally, these will be the two areas. Let's talk about the parts of a circle. We have the center, which we have met already. The circumference, which I believe you already know. The arc, which I shall come to very shortly. The radius, the diameter, and the sector, and the segment. Let's take them one after the other. We have the center of the circle. It is simply that point we call the reference point. A note of caution here. Until a dot and an alphabet, usually O, is inscribed into a circle. Please do not assume that any point, however seemingly close it is to the center, is the center. Do not make that assumption. We will make it crystal clear that it is the center by a dot or end an alphabet, usually O. There are times the alphabet could change from O to say C on any other, but it will be told you very clearly. All right. Let's talk about the arc. Question, what do you call this shape? If you call it a circle, I'm sorry, you are not right. Why not? Well, look at that gap at the top. There is a gap there. So, effectively, that is not a circle. A circle has to be a closed shape. That is an arc. Why is it an arc? Well, maybe your idea of an arc is something like this. And like that. Well, those are arcs, but what we have there is also an arc. Why is this an arc? Well, usually if you did any BDT or technical drawing, you would usually draw that line through those arcs. So something in your mind tells you, well, the one on the left cannot be an arc. Well, it is, because by definition, an arc is an incomplete circle. An arc is an incomplete circle. You would notice that when you were going to draw the arcs on your right, you started from points. The circle on the left, the arc on the left, was also drawn from a point. That is the reference point. So an arc, by definition, is an incomplete circle or a part of a circle, or a curve, more generally. So that is an arc. I hope you're taking these definitions. They will become useful shortly. Let's talk about the circumference. I guess you know what it is. It is the distance round. So we have a circle there. The distance round it is the circumference, just all around it. It is the external boundary enclosing that geometrical figure. The center. We've talked about the center already. That point that is equidistant. And now the radius. Yeah, you've dealt with it. Permit me to go over it with you. It's a revision class. The radius. If we had another point P on the circle, 
the length or the line segment from O to P will be our radius. It is that line segment extending from the center of the circle to the circumference of the circle. The diameter. We normally would say the diameter is twice the radius. Technically, that is right. But for more appropriate definition, assume we have a point A on the circumference of the circle. And another point, say B. If a line joins A to B through A, then we have a diameter. So a diameter must go through the center of the circle from one end, say A, to an opposite end, B. So that is your diameter. Let's talk about the chord. And this is one of my favorites, the chord. So we have a circle. If we have two points PQ on the circle, and we join the points P to Q, that line segment you see on your screen is called a chord. So generally, a chord is a line segment joining two points on any curve, in this case a circle. The chord of a circle is a straight line segment whose endpoints or lie within a circular arc. If we extend it from P to Q and we extend it outward, we no longer have a chord. What we have is a second. We now have a second. Just to make this illustration better, assume we have two other points, A, B. If we join the two points, yes, that's a diameter. But hello, by definition, a chord is simply a line segment joining two points on the circumference of a circle. In other words, like the chord PQ, the line segment AB is also a curve, I mean a chord. So both of them are chords. So a diameter is also a chord. Significantly, the diameter is the longest possible chord in a circle. Let's talk about the tangent. What is a tangent? Given a circle with center O, if we have a point P and we have a line through P that way, touching the circle at just the point P and no other point, what we have is a tangent. So a tangent or a tangent line to a circle is a line that touches the circle at exactly one point at exactly one point, never entering the circle's interior. If it enters the circle's interior, it ceases to be a tangent, it becomes a second. Now the sector. We have a circle with center O. If we have two points PQ, as you can see on your screen, and we have an arc, the arc PQ. Remember, the arc is a part of a circle or an incomplete circle. If those two points, P and Q, join to the center, that whole region, OPQ, is a sector. By the way, because we have formed an arc PQ, another arc PQ in blue on your screen is also formed. So two arcs are formed whenever we pick an arc from a circle. Effectively, two arcs will be picked. But when those two arcs are picked, something happens. If we had it this way, that region will form a sector. But there will be another region. That will be another sector. So the smaller of them is the minor sector, while the larger is the major sector. 
So a sakta could look like this when it has been taken out. And this might remind you of pizza. It's a sakta. Well, we have a major sakta and a minor sakta. And that is your chord. We have a major segment and a minor segment. The segment is the area bounded by a chord and an arc. The bigger one, major, the smaller one, minor. So, key concepts before we go on our break. Chords exist wherever and whenever there are two points on the circumference of a circle. Wherever there are two points on the circumference of a circle, you have a chord. A chord exists as soon as there are two points on the circumference of a circle. When those two points are joined, you have a, a chord. Now, whether or not the chords are joined, there exists a chord. I need you to take note of that because in the exams, the chords will not always be drawn. One of the tests the examiners would want to see or to test you on is to see or to know if you understand that wherever there are two points, there must be a chord. By the way, wherever there is a chord, there has to be an arc. And wherever there is an arc, there has to be a chord. The two always go together. In my opinion, chords are practically the most important part to deal with. Because as you will find out when we come back from the break, you will realize that the entire circle theorem as a topic or subtopic deals with the chord. So just for emphasis, the chord is the line segment between any two points, however close or far away they are from each other, you would have a chord. We will come back from the break and when we do, we will launch into the theorems. I'll see you after the break. Please stay tuned. Hello, you're welcome back to the revision show on your joy learning channel. Once again, I am Danso. Before we went for the break, we were looking at some of the most important concepts. And one of those key concepts was the chord. The chord I would like to emphasize, and it bears repetition, that the chord is practically, or most practically, the most important bit of the circle to consider. Remember we said, wherever there are two points on the circumference of a circle, there will be an arc, because an arc is a part of a circle. Those two points will demarcate a part of the circle. And when those two points exist, whether they are joined visibly or not, there exists a chord, because a chord is a line segment joining two points on the circumference of a circle. Please note, if that line crosses and goes out of the circle, it is no longer a chord. Although the segment within the circle can be called a chord, if we consider the entire line, it will no longer be a chord, it will be a second. To distinguish a second from a tangent, a tangent must always cut the circle outside of it at one point, and only one point. Please take note of that. Let's zoom into our theorems. There are a few of them, and I would like you to see them in a certain way. Recall, when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. Let's go to theorem number one. Our first theorem. The first theorem, I'll state it, and you don't have to bother committing it to memory. 
I would illustrate it as we go forward. The first theorem, and I call it first, not because it must be the first, but it is logical. It says that the angle subtended, remember the word subtend? It means the angle made or formed. The angle subtended by an arc or a chord at the center of a circle is always twice the angle subtended by the same chord or arc on the circumference. Recall we said angles are principally formed at two points for a circle, either at the center or on the circumference. They can be formed elsewhere, but principally, those are the two things to look out for. Now, if circle theorem poses a problem, it is partly because you tend to look at it as a whole. Don't do that. Always look at center, look at circumference. So, if we had that, and we had two points, PQ, as you can see on your screen. If we drew a line from P to Q, that would be the radius. Sorry, P to O, that would be the radius. If we drew another line from Q to O, that would be another radius. As soon as we do that, an angle will be formed. Let's call that angle theta. That angle will be formed at the center of the circle. But as soon as that happens, something else happens. Another angle is formed outside of theta. And if you recall, in our first plane geometry class, we talked about the reflex angle, the angle that bends backwards. So if our angle is theta, then the angle formed outside of it will be 360 minus theta. So, if we have the circle once again, and we had the angle formed. Let's say we had another point, T, on the circumference of the circle. Remember, center and circumference. So when you get a question, quickly look. Center, is there an angle? If there is no center, look at circumference. If there is nothing on circumference, definitely there will be something on circumference. We can start working it out. So, if this angle formed at the center is theta, per the first theorem, it says that the angle at this center will have a certain relationship with an angle at, say, T. So, let's say we have that angle formed at T. See how it is formed. Moving from PQ all the way to T. There will be a relationship. What is the relationship? The angle at T will be half the angle at O. In other words, the angle on the circumference, if it is related to the angle at the center, will always be less. The angle at the circumference will be less than the one at the center. By how much? By half. In other words, two times the angle on the circumference will be equal to the angle at the center. Or half the angle at the center will be equal to the angle on the circumference. That is the first theorem. And one of the challenges with circle theorem is visualizing it. Often it looks a bit um, confusing because there are so many lines, so many angles. Don't bother about them. Just look at center and circumference. Now, so what if the drawing was this way? We have a center. We have an angle at the center. But we also have a point, say, S, not T, a point S, away, more rightward than T. T was at the top, almost leftward. What if we had PQ subtend an angle at S? What would happen? This is what will happen. The same thing that happened the first time will happen now. The angle will be half the angle at the center. So you realize that whether it is at the top left or top right, wherever the direction, so long as it was the same arc or chord that formed the angle at the center that is forming the angle on the circumference, the angle on the circumference will always be half the angle at the center. So, the theorem is repeated in another way. Recall we said that a diameter is also 
a chord. So we have the diameter, which is the longest chord in the circle. Now, in some books, this is taken as a second theorem. It is really not a second one. It is still the same theorem. Now, why is it the same theorem? Because if we had the lines A, I mean the point AB, or the chord AB, subtend an angle at, say, C, on the circumference, the angle at C will be 90 degrees, the right angle. Why would it be 90 degrees? A very simple reason. It's because the angle at O is 180. Because those are angles that meet at a point on a straight line. So by the definition of the first one, it must be half of what is at the circumference. Or twice what is on the circumference. So if the circumference is 90, then the angle at O must be 90 times 2. 180 degrees. Now, it doesn't matter if it's at C. If it was in the opposite segment, for example, so that we have C prime being the other point, the angle will also be 90 degrees for the same reason, because the angle AOB downwards is 180 degrees. So we can say that every diameter will subtend a 90 degrees on the circumference regardless of the direction. So long as it was a diameter that was subtending the angle, then it must be 90 degrees. All right, let's move on. So we have our diameter again, just so that you get the point. 180 and 90. Let's do our second theorem. The second theorem is more like from the first in a number of ways. Take a look at this. We have our circle center O with points PQ on the circumference. An, uh, an angle has been subtended at the center, the angle theta. If we have another angle at point T subtended, we say that that angle must be half. But, and the same with point S. So we realize that no matter how many points on the circumference we have, if it was the same chord or arc, PQ, that formed or subtended them, their value must be the same. They will all be theta over two. So our second theorem, effectively says the angle subtended by a chord or an arc in a segment must be of equal magnitude. The angles formed by a chord or an arc in the same segment must be of equal magnitude. So, so long as the chords, the, the, sorry, the angles subtended on the circumference were so subtended by the chord or by the, a particular arc, not a different one, the same arc or the same chord, the value of the angles on the same segment or circumference must be equal. So when you are solving problems, check. Is it the same chord or arc creating these angles? If they, are, if they have been created by the same chord or by the same arc, then you can be sure their values will be the same. Hopefully we'll solve a few problems and you'll be able to see how this works out.